Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, for God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The word of the Lord. Turning over, let us read together Psalm number 31. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. For my life is wasted with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies, and even to my neighbors, a dismay to those of my acquaintance. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. I am forgotten like a dead man out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd. Fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant and in your loving kindness save me. Our second reading this morning is from the letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who Though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then the apostles began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. A dispute also arose among the apostles as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater? the one who is at the table or the one who serves. It is not the one at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, The cock will not crow this day until you have denied me three times that you know me. Jesus said to his apostles, When I sent you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, No, not a thing. Jesus said to them, But now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag. And the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counting among the lawless. And indeed, what is written about me is being fulfilled. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. He replied, It is enough. Jesus came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. While Jesus was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, 
Is it with a kiss that you were betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around Jesus saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched the slave's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then the crowd seized Jesus and led him away. The crowd brought Jesus into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing Peter in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But Peter denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else, on seeing Peter, said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with the prisoner, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while Peter was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? They kept heaping many other insults on Jesus. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and scribes, gathered together, and they brought Jesus to their council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. Jesus replied, If I tell you, will you, be will you not believe? And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, Are you, then, the Son of God? Jesus said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse Jesus, saying, we found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, he stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he began even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, Pilate sent Jesus off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to see him for a long time because he had heard about Jesus and was hoping to see him perform some sign. Herod questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated Jesus with contempt and mocked him. Then Herod put an elegant robe on Jesus and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. 
And here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, this man has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then the elders all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us! Barabbas was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! A third time Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But the elders kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that Jesus should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. Pilate released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led Jesus away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country. And when they laid the cross on him and, and made him carry it behind Jesus, a great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with Jesus. Please stand. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over Jesus that read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding Jesus and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all Jesus' acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly 
for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Joseph took the body down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. Please be seated. At the time of Jesus, there were about 40,000 people living in Jerusalem. But at the Passover, the population of the city swelled by another 200,000 people. It's a lot of people. They were coming to celebrate the Passover, that ritual that remembered the freedom of the Israelites from the oppression of Pharaoh, where the, Moses parted the Red Sea and they escaped journeyed for 40 years, and finally landed in the promised land. The descendants of that group of wanderers ended up throughout the Holy Land. But a whole bunch of them were in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was a heavenly city. According to the ancient scriptures, it was both the place where God's word would be fulfilled but also a place where because so many people lived and because people in power tended to abuse that power, there was also corruption and sin. It represented the kind of paradox of life with which all of us live, the blessings and the burdens that come with our circumstances and our place in life and the world. So at this time when so many pilgrims were flooding Jerusalem and the population was so large, Rome was a little nervous. They didn't like the idea that Passover, which celebrated liberation and freedom, might lead to some, shall we say, ideas that might fuel the people gathered to rise up against the oppression of Rome. And so, a procession of Roman soldiers entered the city on this day from the west, mounted on horseback, wearing armor, carrying banners. They were an impressive force and loud and noisy. Imagine all those hoof prints beating against the ground, the dust stirring up, the voices and the shouts, metal clanking metal an impressive presentation of military power and might. Enter Jesus, coming from the east and the Mount of Olives, entering the city by another gate on the back of a donkey. Now that may seem like a kind of silly thing, but for the people of Israel, for the Jews, coming in on the back of a donkey was also symbolic of a victory lap if you will. Leaders of their own people historically would be honored in such a way, claiming their victory in front of their people by entering the community on the back of a donkey. And more than that, the palms being waved and placed on the ground before Jesus on this pathway into the holy city, those palms represented independence and victory and triumph. Rome, impressive on this side. Jesus, humble and unhappy. The two symbols clash. And it's no wonder that the people were worried that because Jesus had gathered a following and bore all manner of influence among the people and those gathered there for the Passover, that maybe on this occasion, 
an uprising would take place. But for now, we celebrate Jesus and his entrance into the city in triumph. And what is it about which he was triumphant? Well, for one thing, he had been proclaiming and encouraging, along with John the Baptist, for people to repent. And unlike today, where we talk about repentance as turning away from sin, in that day, repentance was about claiming freedom in God. Whoa, whole different way of looking at the word. It further meant in Greek an opening, or a way, and a journey. So put those things together and to repent was to claim one's independence in God and journey toward the fullness of life in God. That was the triumph of Christ on this day, that he was gathering his people and his followers and his apostles with him in a journey to celebrate and acknowledge their freedom in God. Now, such an effort would, in fact, lead to his demise, and we are well aware of that. But this day, today, Palm Sunday, we are invited to journey with Jesus in that path, on that path, toward the whole and full life that can be ours in God. We are being released encouraged, nurtured, sustained in that effort to journey toward God. And as we are on that path, imagine ourselves with those others there in Jerusalem on that day, together cheering and rejoicing that the one who will help that effort along is there in their midst. Because we know that Jesus is in our midst that he is always present with us, for us, and available to us. And that our freedom that he released for all time has been made available through that cross. It is a matter of opening a doorway, or if you will, of acknowledging that that temple curtain torn in two separated forever the barriers between us and God. That temple curtain used to be what the priests would go behind to make sacrifice on behalf of the people. It kept the people out here and the priests in here. With the tearing of that temple curtain, that barrier was gone. Access to God no longer depended on the sacrifices of the priests because instead it was being taken on by the sacrifice of Jesus. The way has been opened for us to journey with Jesus toward the heart of God. And we know what awaits us later in this week, what difficulty and struggle and challenge and pain will accompany our journey with him through this holy week. But today, let's celebrate that victory of freedom. Let's journey together on a path that leads us into the full heart of God. And there with others, proclaim Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Proclaim him and claim him as our own, as God has already proclaimed him and claimed him as his. On this day, join on the journey toward God, toward wholeness, toward healing and restoration and, yes, resurrection. And when that day comes, the celebration will be all the sweeter, all the more, uh, clamorous isn't really a good word here, but it's the one that comes to mind around which we can clamor. And together we will celebrate and rejoice in all that has been given to us and done for us from a place of love and, yes, freedom. 
Amen. Will you please stand and join me in reciting the words of our faith as found in the Nicene Creed, page 358 in the prayer book. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the people, Form 2. Prayers of the people, Form 2 is found on page 385. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishops, Michael, Ian, and Laura, for the Nigerian bishops, John and Marcus, for our rector, Anne, and for this gathering, and for all the ministers and people for the candidates nominated by the Bishop Transition Committee, for the consideration as our next Bishop Diocesan, and for the ECTT Convention delegates as they discern the choices standing for election. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the Royal family, Nancy, Zimbo, John, Silas, Geraldine, the Taylor family, Malika Roach and family, Ellen, Linda, Chuck, Amber, Katrinda, Rosie Grace, and those committed to our ongoing prayers. For those affected with the coronavirus, their families and communities, for those who work puts them at risk of infection for healthcare workers and professionals who continue to treat individuals infected by the virus and for their families, for nursing homes, staff, and residents, the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him.
pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the repose of the soul of the 983,000 people in the United States and the 6.1 million people worldwide whose lives have been lost as a result of the coronavirus. Pray for those who have died. We give thanks for members of our armed forces serving at home and abroad and for their families, especially Kenneth Braley Jr., Rachel Nunes Jr., Kevin Morrell, Jason Serra, Jason Duvall, and Ryan Waite. We pray for victims of the natural disasters and human violence throughout the world, especially the people of Ukraine, for victims of gun violence in the United States, for indigenous Asian American, Pacific Islanders, peoples impacted by racism, by centuries of anti-black bias, and for others seeking to undo the harm of racism and hate, for groups to whom we extend hospitality through the use of our building, especially the Hindu community group. I ask your prayers for the concerns and organizations supported by St. Peter's through mission, especially South Windsor Human Services. In our parish cycle of prayer, we give thanks for the holy remembrance of Christ's passion through Holy Week, for the ministry of the Finance Committee, for parish members Dorsey and the Eaton families, and Glenn Flanagan and Leslie Royer and Isabel Lundy, who are celebrating birthdays this week. We rejoice with Daniel Bell and Rachel Malone, who will be confirmed this Easter Eve at Christ Church Cathedral. For what else are we thankful? Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty God, you made us in your image and call us to share in the renewal of this world. Inspire us to seek and serve Christ in all persons, that the proclamation of your good news in our worship, in our words, and in our work may lead us into the fullness of your love. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Using the form of confession found on page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please greet one another with a sign of God's peace that feels safe. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The great thanksgiving continues on page 361 in the prayer book. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For our sins, he was lifted high upon the cross that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 
Therefore, let us keep the feast. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
using the prayer of thanksgiving found on page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Handful of announcements, I think all of which are in the bulletin, but just underscore. Later this week, we have Monday, Thursday with a washing of feet. And I know that is um, something that's kind of like out there for some of you. So let me try and you know break it down into simple, non-scary terms. You only have to take off one, you only have to do one foot, you hold it over a bucket, and somebody will splash a little water over it. It's really painless. And then there's a towel to dry the foot. You can put it back in your sock or shoe or whatever you're wearing on your feet. It's really very easy. That's Thursday. We'll also strip the altar following the liturgy. Friday, Good Friday at 7 o'clock with um, communion out of the reserve sacrament, which we will consecrate Thursday night. Uh, Saturday evening, if you'd like to come celebrate the confirmation of Andrew and Rachel, Christ Church Cathedral at 7.30. If you've never been to an Easter Eve celebration, it's pretty cool. I invite you to come. Uh, you can park at the stage company, probably. I say probably because usually you can park there for cathedral things, but they're, if they're having a show, then the garage can get a little crowded. So I'm not quite sure what the other options are for parking, but we'll sort it out if you want to come. Sunday, Easter, next Sunday, 8 and 10. And after that, other things are kind of in the bulletin. We really need bakers, though, for our bake sale for the spring vendor fair. If we don't have people bake, there's nothing to sell. And then we don't make any money. And this is a fundraiser. So um, we need some folks to come and bake. I know that's a weekday for people who are working. That's a little challenge. Mission Commission will be here, though, into the evening. Um, they're coming like at four-ish until about eight. So come after work. We will provide flour, sugar, butter, eggs, um, mixing bowls, spoons, measuring things, and some baking pans. So really bring your recipe, show up, and if you've got other things like chocolate chips or chocolatey things or sprinkles, bring those too. Um, you know, but we'll have basics just to try and keep your life simple. And I think that's all I want to do right now. Other things are in light breezes and in the bulletin. Other announcements that I've overlooked. Okay, then go out into the world in peace. Be of good courage, hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, tend the sick, honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of God's Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always.
go in peace to love